Yes, good morning, everyone. And uh, my name is Nozomu Takeuchi. I'm from uh, Chiba University in Japan. And uh, yeah, just, well, I just afraid to miss this talk. You know, it's now six o'clock in the morning, but yeah, I just finished the face, wash on my face and a uh, cup of coffee. So I'm now ready to start. And uh, first of all, well, thank you very much for Tabi who, and uh, as a member to, who is arranging these global seminars. Yeah, during such a very difficult situation of this world. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm mostly attending this meeting in the, watching in the YouTube, but I really enjoyed it and uh, learned many things about following the latest glaciology things. And uh, I'm very honored to give a talk today. And uh, my talk is about cryogenites, the dark side of Croatia. And the first of all, I just a little bit talk about what is the dark side first. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you know who is this here, yeah, right? Yeah, he's a Darth Vader, maybe most popular icon of the dark side of the world, I think. And I'm, a, I, I'm actually a fan of the Star Wars, and uh, I just remember when I was a kid, my father took me to the movie theater, and uh, yeah, that's my first time to watch the Star Wars movie, and that really, that's really impressive. It's spectacular universe and galaxies and uh, lots of strange creatures there. Yeah, probably most of you know the story, but just in case I little bit explain who is this. And the Darth Vader is kind of bad side people. And if he wants to control everything in the galaxy and the universe using the dark side of the force. Force is kind of key of this movie, sorry. It which is a supernatural power. And on the other side, there is a Jedi who is a good people and uh, they are guardians of order and justice with the force and they also can use the force and force it's can use only the selected people in the stories and they are fighting each other across the galaxy that's a story right and um, as, as i remember i just one of the most impressive words uh, in this story is a word of yoda so He's a Yoda. Yoda is a Jedi master. And uh, he's training young Jedi, who is a Luke Skywalker, probably. And uh, during the training, he just told him, so if you want to be a Jedi, you have to know the dark side of the Force. So the, what is the dark side of the Force? He said, the anger, fear, aggression, it's, it's kind of spiritual things, but probably he wants to tell him, you know, it's force is, it's not perfect. It's a, you know everything about the force. Then what I learned from this Star Wars is, you know, everything in the world has two sides, which is light and dark. And maybe this is common sense in the, like uh, this, Chinese ancient symbol, philosophical symbol, inyo. This is popular in Japan as well. So meaning uh, light and dark. The world is just consisting of light and dark sides. And uh, easy to find, if you look around, you know, for example, like uh, politician is already typical two sides. They are speaking good things, but later, it's a lot of scandal. It's a lot of, everywhere in the world, I think. And even me, myself, I have probably two sides, sometimes thinking very good things. Oh, I have to help the students. But other days when student brought me the draft of manuscript of oh, this is garbage. Oh, it's not science at all or something. It's not probably bad side. But anyway, Let's think about glaciers or glaciology. And right side of glacier, it's definitely snow and ice because it's beautiful and uh, pure of material, water. And the study of snow and ice in the rule of physics, this is the right way of science, I think. I agree that 
So that's the right side of glaciology, actually. And what is the dark side of glacier? Now I would say that is cryogenite, because cryogenite looks really dark and uh, not pure material. It mixes mix of everything. Well, but something very strange materials. So, but here I'd like to say, if you want to master the glaciology, you have to run the dark side of glaciers. That's why I think giving a talk today. So then, okay, let's start the, about cryogenites. So what is cryogenites? So he's a godfather of cryogenites. It's Adolf Nordenschultz. He's a famous Swedish Arctic explorer, I think. And he's probably famous first crossed the Northern Passage of the Arctic Ocean. They actually, he stopped here in Japan too. And uh, it's a lot of records. Yeah, it's very interesting. And uh, this is one of the, his article published in Geological Magazine in 1872. It's exactly 150 years ago. Well, and this is a kind of report of his Greenland expedition. And uh, when he explores the Greenland ice sheet, he found something on the ice. And let's see, the substance here is not a clay, but the sandy tragic material of composition, which indicates that it not originate in the granite origin of Greenland. Its origin appears therefore to me very enigmatical. Does it come from the basalt region or from the suppose volcanic tracts or interior of granite, or is it of meteoric origin? So it's kind of very strange material. He doesn't know about that. Then uh, it would perhaps be desirable to enter it under separate class in the register of science. Well, then he proposed for this substance the name cryogenite. So cryo means uh, ice from Greek words and konid means a uh, dust. So cryogenite means basically dust on the ice. So actually there are some several definitions of cryogenite, but in my talk, it's okay. It's dust of ice. This is a cryogenite. And uh, let me talk a little bit about my first encounter of the cryogenite. So when I was undergraduate student, so almost 30 years ago, I met a professor who is uh, Shiro Koshima. And he just retired Kyoto University last year. And he, uh, he is an entomologist and an alpinist as well. And when I took his class, it was wonderful. And I just really excited his class. He is just well, traveling of the glacier in the world and uh, try to find the insects because he's an entomologist. And uh, yeah, this is a typical of his kind of wearing on the, during his field work. Yeah, he had hold a ice axis, one hand, and the other hand, he hold a net for the collecting the insects. So yeah, yeah it, then it's very easy to, for me to decide to join his group because I'm also Crime, well, belonging to the climbing club, alpine club. So it's, you know, go to the mountains and look, and look for some, some things, doing science. It's, it's be really exciting to me. Then I joined his group. Okay, then this is one of his major publication about his discovery of the insects and published in Nature in 1984. He found the uh, insect on the Himalayan glacier. It's a, uh, the insect is a midge. Midge is, is uh, like this. This is a uh, kind of, kind of looks like mosquito. It's small mosquito, and but it's wingless. It, it doesn't have insects. And this insect is just walking on the glacier surface. And the uh, yeah, point is, it's, he, this insect is not temporary visitor. He's 
they are spending and full of the leaves on the glaciers. That means the egg, larvae, adults, so full of the and life cycle is closed on the glaciers. And when I he talked with the professor, okay, well, what can I do for my master or PhD work? And he said, okay, I, I found this insect, but I don't know what exactly they are, they are eating on the glacier. So if, there should be something on the glacier. So you can try, find, try to find it. Okay, that sounds interesting. Then my journey is started. Okay, it was fortunate actually. There was a big project in Japan at that time. It was 1994. It's about glaciological projects read by the Professor Ageta and Nagao of Nagoya University. It's kind of the glacier, just investing glacier as a response of global warming in Himalaya or something. Then I got the opportunity to go to the Himalayas. Yeah, wow, I spent almost many times actually, you know, almost one year in Nepal actually. Wow, it was a wonderful time. And this is a Yara glacier. And uh, the glacier, he found the uh, insects. And uh, this is my first experience of glacier. And uh, I stayed there. Uh, yeah, it's your four member of us with a glaciologist in the make, stay in the camp in front of the glacier for the month. The elevation is 5,000 over the fire. It was hard, but it's, it was a very nice time to sharing with a professional glaciologist. We, I learned a lot of things from about Gracia in during this camp. But okay, let's see something what we see on these glaciers. Okay, this is a Mitch, and uh, you can just find it very easily. This is a September, and lots of this small insect is walking. So up to the certain direction, this is upstream, it is a Gracia actually, because they are very specialized on the glacier, so they want to stay on the glacier, but the glacier is moving, flowing actually. So if they want to stay on one side, finally they washed out, out of the glacier, but so that's, that's why they have to walk up to upstream the glacier. That, that's an interesting thing of this insect. And if we, we watch in uh, melt water, so it's lots of, looks like other, other insects in the, war, in the moving. This is a larvae of the meat, the insects. It's a lot. This is summertime. So all of that, it gets adult in the September and put the egg upstream. And then next spring, they come up. That's a life cycle of this meat. And you might see another creature, the red small one, that one. Okay, this is, this is a copper pot. Copper pot is a common name, is a water freeze. And uh, yeah, it's a lot. It's uh, so many copper pots just walking around the Cryogland Hall and uh, melt water stream. Yeah, this is kind of amazing and uh, actually beautiful. It's uh, in terms of color and red and ice. And you see some sediments, that's a cryogenite. Okay, then, yeah, actually they are eating something on the glacier. It's dark colored material, yeah, which is cryogenite. But we don't know, we don't know exactly what is cryogenite. So I started to examine the, what this cryogenite is. So this is a cryogenite on the other glacier. And if you carefully watch the cryogenite, it's not fine sediment. The point is there looks like a very small granule. So forming the granule, its size is less than one millimeter. It's very small. But I just try to see what is this granule. Okay, this is one granule observed with the electron microscope. So we see, it, it looks like kind of a planet, planet, right? Planet in universe, but it's beautiful. But you find, might find something on the surface of granules. It's like filaments. Yeah, that's a 
kind of filament things. But what, what is that? So, okay, this is another image of the cryogenites. It's a fluorescence microscope. Fluorescence it means a kind of chemical sub certain chemical substance has a certain color of fluorescence. You can see them in the microscope. In this case, this red color is a chlorophyll fluorescence. Chlorophyll is a photosynthetic pigment. So every plant or photosynthetic organism has it. So yeah, this filament is yeah photosynthetic microbes actually. It was cyanobacteria. It's it looks like this. It's photosynthetic microbes. So the cyanobacteria, the filament is entirely covered with the surface of cryogenite. But the question is, yeah, it is really forming on the glacier because the measure water temperature is well, just zero degrees. Yeah, cyanobacteria is a common microbe. You can find everywhere the pond and river, but in the zero degree, it's hard to probably to grow. Then I did one experiment on this glacier. I just mashed, it crushed every, these granules and put in the plastic gel and uh, leave it on the glacier surface for uh, three months actually. And some of pots, it's shaded sunlight with army oil and some of that put in uh, a copper sulfide which inhibits the photosynthesis of microbes and the other ones just leave it then after three months this is the result again yeah the mashed cryogenite again they aggregate after three months this control and uh, i confirmed it's a uh, lot of again cyanobacterial filament on the surface so it's exactly they are forming this aggregation but other a copper sulfate and without sunlight, they didn't form it. So certainly this photosynthetic cyanobacteria is forming, making the granules. Okay, this is another image and uh, this is a cross section. I cut the cross section and observe the same fluorescent microscope. And what we see, so that this cyanobacteria, active cyanobacteria is distributed only on the surface of granules. And what is the inside? Inside is probably kind of a dead body of cyanobacteria, microbes, and some yeah, kind of organic matter we call the humic substance. It, it color is really dark. And those are probably microbes and also mineral particles as well. And this is another image of cross section of granules. And what we found is, yeah, it's, you see, there, it's a lot of ring inside within a granule. So what is this ring? It, it's, it's probably, it's same as tree ring. So they are probably annually growing because, you know, the microbes can grow only the milk season, which means about three months in summer. And winter is almost frozen on the glacier, so they are just sleeping on the glacier. So that makes this kind of ring, annual ring in the glacier. So I count it in case of this granule, the three. So probably age of this granule is three years. And the other granule is more interesting. It's there is a lot of small granules inside. The, I count this four small granules just combine and form one big granule here. And as a more bigger one, we see the crack of the granule. So probably they are broken when they grow in certain sites. So now we, we now understand what is cryogenite, this granule. So they are growing on the glacial surface by the, this filament cyanobacteria. It takes more probably three or three, yeah, maximum seven years. I counted the years. And every season they are slowly growing. And when they grow certain sites, they just fragment, broken. And it's that each fragment again, it's growing again. So the number of granules is increasing on the glacier. That is life cycle of cryogenites. And actually the well, insects or other creatures that's eating them. It's probably cryogenites. It's very tasty for them. And okay, and the size of granule is also 
really important because it's when the granules grow certain size. Inside of the granule, it changes some chemical condition, which is anoxic condition, which is less oxygen inside. So that allows the another type of bacteria, certain type of bacteria. So the, the making of the granule allows the very diverse bacteria living together within the granules. And each of the bacteria has a certain function. Function means uh, like uh, chemical reactions. So some, some, some bacteria making certain organic matter or certain nutrient or something. So something like cryogranite is kind of bioreactors. So they are making, I, I would say here, the cryogranites make the melt with sweet. Sweet means uh, good for the other microbes. It just recently, I just, we well, are interesting since I received an email from the scientists, but who is not glaciologist, but, or a microbiologist, who is actually working civil engineering. And uh, he, he is just saying, I found something, something very similar to cryogranite you found on the glacier. And I asked him, well, where did you find it? I found it. It's here, treatment, water treatment plant. Wow. It's it's completely different environment, but he found it's certain granular structure of cyanobacteria actually, and well, well that's interesting. Well, let's compare us between cryogranite and this granule, and uh, yeah, lots of similarity, but also some difference like for it once, and uh, but we we I, I believe this is a lot of hint to understand what is cryogranite, and yeah, certain. Just recently, we published this well, this very interesting exper uh, experience on the paper. So, if you're interested in this this publication, and yeah, sometimes science expands into very unexpected field of science. Well, that's a very interesting experience for me. And my journey started in the, after the, my PhD works in the last 20, 25 years. Yeah, I fortunately travel a lot on the glacier across the Asian glaciers and the Arctic as well, Greenland, Svalbard, and Alaska, and Patagonia. And I, all I found the cryogonite all of the glacier, all of the glacier. Yeah, it's, it's, there are some variations, like in terms of color, of shape, but I would say all of the glacier on this planet have say it's dark side, right? And just, this is also recent our publication. Wow, it's uh, so many authors. So this is all cryogonite collectors in the world. Just get together and uh, just compare all the cryogonites. Yeah, this is interesting papers. So even some, some from the Africa and America and Arctic in the polar region. And uh, just, well, it's not, not, not strong conclusion, but we see it's a lot of variation in some geographical trends. That's a big part. And then next question, probably. Yeah, they are forming by the, formed by the cyanobacteria, but cyanobacteria is all the same species or how many species in the glacier? So again, this cyanobacteria is a very special species growing on the glacier, specialized at glacier, it's called temperatures. Then we can use the molecular technique, which is DNA analysis, and see how many species on the glacier making the cryogonites. And uh, I, we analyzed all of our collection of cryogonites from the Antarctic, Arctic, and the Asian glaciers. And finally, I, we found uh, and 20 species from the, of the glacier cyanobacteria. This is a list of cyanobacteria. It, it, how do you think it's many or less? Yeah, it, it's, yeah. Actually, cyanobacteria, full cyanobacteria is so many more than some, well, I don't know, I don't know, maybe, but only the 20 cyanobacteria species can live, can grow on the glacier ice. But, and uh, 
only in four or five species of them is dominated on the glacier actually. And let's see, in for example, this one, number OT4, we found this species only mainly on the Asian glacier. So this color means uh, blue means are very abundant on this sample of the glaciers. So only the Asian glacier. We we couldn't find um, in the Arctic polar glacier, it's only few. So this species may be localized in Asian glacier, but on the other hand, the other one did, for example, this one. This one can be, it looks like dominating the Arctic glacier. It's mostly in the Greenland Svalbard, but they are also can find on the Asian glacier too. It's not dominated, but yeah. So it, this is probably kind of global species. They are just trees everywhere in the world. So we say this is cosmopolitan. So some species are locals and some species are cosmopolitan. But question is how they disappear with cryosphere in the world. It's 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 very it's kind of really a little bit complicated. We still questions actually. But the you know the journey of human ourselves, we are born in two two hundred thousand years ago in Africa. And we cross uh, across a continent from Africa, Eurasia, and Americas, and finally some glacial exist in Antarctic continents. But probably same, it's cyanobacteria again, maybe make a journey across the cryosphere, but cryosphere is not, um, I, well, they're actually isolated at present, Arctic, Arctic. So how they disperse, that's a question. It's probably, it's climate change. Yeah, as you know, it's in, in sometime in the past, crisis is much bigger, maybe continuous, and they just split out in the world, or I don't know. But maybe it's complicated, cyanobacteria, it's much longer history than our humans. But this is kind of one of the big questions, and we are still exploring this. And this is global distribution of Croatia is probably important when I when we think about glacial darkening and uh, yeah I just finally talk a little bit about glacial darkening okay it's there are lots of publications reporting this phenomena in the last two decades I think many Greenland I see it yeah Greenland I see it it's certain part it's making really darker and not only Greenland some alpine glaciers it's also it's getting darker in the recent tree. There are several factors for darkening of glacier, of course, as he probably knows. For example, black carbon is uh, really black. And the uh, mineral blast, it also gets darkening the ice. And microbes, again, yeah, they are also cause of darkening of glacier, definitely. And I believe cryogranite is also one of the major factors to darkening the ice of glaciers. And, okay, this is a glacier in Tenshan, in Asia, in China. And you see the surface of this glacier really dark, dusty, and, uh, but it looks like dust. But if you watch carefully on the surface, it's not simple dust. It's all cryogranite granule, actually. Yeah, it's amazing. And darkening glacier is uh, maybe not, yeah, this is kind of physics of glacier. Yes, many glaciers are just concerned about that because it's reduced um, surface albedo and uh, just enhance the melting of glaciers. So the darkening is uh, one of another reason to shrinking the pressure other than the global warming, as well as global warming. So, so we need to apply the darkening recently. And on this glacier, it's, I, yeah, this is, I just scratched the surface of glacier surface. Uh, yeah, this is the original surface of glacier with cryogranite. It's really dark. And when 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 I clean up the surface, it's very clean, white ice. It's appeared. So difference is very clear as when we try to measure the albedo, spectral albedo. 
of the two surface. Yeah, the original surface is really low. This is 0.1 or very low albedo. But when we clean up in the surface, the albedo is more than 0.5 or something. It's just general clean bare ice surface without cryon plants. So yeah, we are, it, it's very clear to this cryogonite is a big impact, impact on the glacial melting. But here, I just a little bit afraid. Okay, some of you, maybe glaciologists, okay, let's, let's kill them. Then clean up the glacier. Then we can save the glaciers. Yeah. Okay, that maybe that's it's one of the idea, but yeah, I, I, wow, because I'm studying the cryogonites, I don't like that. So it's it's kind of fighting between right side of glacier and dark side of glacier. It's something like Star Wars. I would say it's ice wars, but I'd like to say to avoid the ice wars, what we cannot do. So probably we can understand each, each other more, right? So, okay, this is some of my experience. Wow, I'm a data and I correct it. This is abundance of cryoconites in my collection of the glaciers. And uh, yeah, and what I found is, I know, abundance of cryoconites much larger, greater in Asian glaciers. This is all Asian glacier from Himalayas, Tenshan, Chiranshan. It's more than 300 dry weight ground per square meter or something. But as a polar Arctic glacier, or polar glacier, it's much less than that. It's, it's, as you see the last slide, it's very clean. The abundance is less than 100 or something. And when I, we, we measure the albedo, it's, it's clearly different between these two types of glacier, Asian and uh, other type of glaciers. So the question is why? <clears throat> okay, then probably what I'm thinking is there are three types of the glaciers in terms of cryogonite distributions. And Asian glacier has uh, lots of cryogonites and they cover the entire surface of glacier. Yeah, there is a cryogonite holes, but also other part of the ice was covered by its same cryogonite granules actually. So it looks really dark. And this is definitely, yeah, they are promoting the melting of the glaciers. But Arctic glaciers, yeah, it, it looks white and blue, it's a beautiful, but there are cryogonites. Cryogonite is where? It's in a hole, actually cryogonite holes. And cryogonite hole is much deeper than Asian glaciers. So yeah, this is the difference between Asia and Asia Arctic. And there is another type of glacier, which is Antarctica. Well, actually, I never been to Antarctica yet. But Antarctica, there are cryogonites, but cryogonite in a hole, and but hole it's actually invisible. It's because it's there is littered by ice. So ice littered cryogonite holes. It's this, this is a typical Antarctic cryogonite. So the question is, what's the difference of these three types of glaciers? So darkening of glacier may explain changing type of this Arctic type to Asian glacier, Asian types. So it's the question is they are just geographically determined of these three types of glaciers, or yeah, it's cryogonite hole is strongly connected. I know the strongly connected surface energy balance of the surface. So the change of surface energy balance makes a change of type of this glacier or climate change. And also microbes as well. Some like yeah, difference of microbes of each type of glaciers. And probably the supply of simply may simply affect the abundance of cryogonites, I think. So, but yeah, this is still, I didn't have clear answer to explain all that. But yeah, this is one of our big 
still big questions of our studies. And finally, I want to mention one more reason why we shouldn't kill the cyanobacteria on the glaciers. As you probably know, cyanobacteria is very old organisms. Yeah, yeah. If we can find a fossil in a rock. For example, this is a, wow, it's 3.3 .3 billion years ago. It's very old. And uh, yeah, cyanobacteria is actually, it's this species, it's a very long history on this planet. Of, okay, this is a climate change history of entire Earth history. And the rest is about the history of glacier. Its glacier appears on this planet on, I mean, the first glaciation. It's, it's, it's again, it's a still lots of argument, but probably kind of 2.2 billion years ago. It's known as Huronian glaciation or fast snowball ass or something. Before that, yeah, I see it's much warmer. There is no glacier in this planet. But the point is, you know, history of cyanobacteria, appearance of cyanobacteria is much before the appearance of the glaciers. That's the point. So cyanobacteria is much older than glaciers, actually. Yeah. Yeah, and they are actually a strong relationship. Because as probably know, is uh it's early time of us is uh, mostly the atmospheric composition, it's carbon dioxide. It's full of greenhouse gas. It's getting warmer of the planet. But when cyanobacteria emerges in this planet, they are eating the carbon dioxide and oxidize the atmospheric composition. And that makes, you know, degrees of greenhouse and climate cooling. And finally, glacier appears on this planet. So then we could say the cyanobacteria, it's cre created glacier on this planet, on the Earth. And without the dark side, so I'd say the result of dark side of cyanobacteria, no longer, no glacier on this planet. So, so we may, so understand of this dark side. This is that's important. Okay, then now, yeah, almost finalized. I just finalized my talk in two days. So what are the light sides and dark side of glaciers? And dark side, it's yeah, again, it's not the ice of glacier, and uh, this is important actually. It's a lot of concerns uh, how glacier change in the future and in the past as well. And dark side of glacier, it's, it's kind of it's microbes and uh, it's substance of carbon and probably nitrogen or phosphate, phosphorus or other substance. It's probably dark sides of glaciers. And um, yeah, they are not separate. They are interacting with each other because of, as I told you, it's darkening of glaciers. It's, it's, big impact on the glaciers, variation, melting. So now we should study separately, but it's just we are both studied together. So we could truly understand glaciers when we unify the cycle of these two cycles, water and the other substance. Then we can understand what is glacier is, Okay, then it's a uh, final slides of my talk. And uh, for me, glacier is alive. It's, it looks like it's big creatures in the world because they are buried and interacted. It's not, so their variation is not explained purely in the climate, it's physical climate, but I believe it's certainly their dark side, cryocline, does affect on the glacier variation. 
And as I mentioned earlier of my talk, it's a very diverse organism living on the glaciers. And cryogonite is certainly the source of this life. Of life lives on the glaciers, so they are allowed to live on the glaciers. So this is a actually concept of glacier ecosystems. It's so diverse glaciers actually than we've thought. So this is my final message. It's a uh, studies on the light and dark side of glaciers. It's made glaciology more exciting, I believe, and uh, very peaceful. And this is a message. And uh, thank you very much for listening. And uh, yep, this is a uh, last slide for next week. Yeah. And thank you again. That's my talk. Thank, thank you so much. Um, yes, so um, we'll come back to next week's seminar um, at the end, but what a fantastic talk. Um, anyone who can combine uh, Star Wars and glaciology certainly has to uh, be a fantastic speaker. So um, what we usually do is we ask uh, people with questions to just type into the chat to show that they've got a question um, and then we get them to unmute. So if anyone would like to ask Nazuma a question, um, Wajay Zeng, do you want to unmute yourself um, and ask your question? Yeah, sure. Um, can, can you hear me? Yes, yes, please. Go okay, ahead. Cool. Well, thank you so much. This is a great and wonderful talk. Uh, I have a quick question about the albedo thing. So looks like, yes, the cryoconite actually decreased the albedo of the glacier surface. But um, I, I feel like uh, part of the additional energy should be transferred into the, you know, the input of the photosynthesis, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. So uh, how much is actually the, uh, the net? Uh, energy that can be transferred to melting the glacier. Oh, okay. Yeah, it can be calculated. It's biogeochemically. Well, it's, it's energy for photosynthesis. But I would say energy for the photosynthesis is very small, only little part for the entire energy to incoming to the glaciers because well, they are very efficient. And, uh, and the, when I see See the cryogonites, entire mass of photosynthesis microbes is very small, actually. As I shown, these granules, and they are living on the covered on the only surface of cryogonite. Other part is more other general well, humic substance or mineral particles. So their absorption is much bigger than for use for photosynthesis. So I would say 90% or more, something more. It's more to using for melting, I think. Yeah. Ah, uh, okay. So, so these uh, small creatures, small yeah. microbes, still works I like see. dirt, mm -hmm. like darker dirt. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Does anyone else have a question for the Um Uh, can I can I speak? Yeah. Yeah, please. Yeah, my question is: uh, uh, We have started basically some cryogenite studies in Kashmir region of Western Himalayas. So you you said something about dispersed cryogenites on the surface of Asian glaciers. How do we discriminate whether this is a uh, basically this uh, dispersed cryogenite or whether it is mineral dust or black carbon on the on the surface of a glacier physically? Can we do it? I'm sorry, I can't say again. Yeah, how can we discriminate whether the surface of a glacier is covered by a dispersed cryconite or whether this dispersed material on the on the glacier surface is is something like dust? Oh, dust. Oh, yeah, that's a big question. Yeah, good question. Yeah, well, we have to see. Yeah, inside on the glacier, it's a, it's the easiest way. But you know, 
it's, it's certainly some glacier is covered with dust, but in generally, in the abrasion on ice surface, it's you know, ice. It's fine dust easily just washed out by the melt water. But cryogonite granule is a certain size. It's easy. Just they can, it's, it's, it's because of the size of, they are just remain, easy to remain on the glaciers. But yeah, of course, we have to watch on the glaciers and uh, it's cryogonite granule is a, it's kind of, kind of effect to keep all of the material on the glacier. If without uh, cyanobacteria, maybe just dust is just easily go out, wash out of the glacier. But in the snow surface, it's, yeah, it, it's dust remains and uh, this is it's, it's as seen with many glacier. But, well, but anyway, if, if you wanna discriminate this, you have to, well, maybe investigate yourself and uh, watch it. It's easy to find the cryogonite or dust. It is easy to just, uh, yeah, discriminate it. Is that answer for you? Uh, yeah, yeah, it is, it is, it is. And regarding, regarding basically the contribution of cryogonites in glacier melt, besides albedo, for example, can we do energy balance of, of these cryogonite holes physically? To, to precisely quantify basically if you if you look at the ablation surface the variation as far as the altitudinal variation of these cryconites does vary uh, as we have seen in some of the glaciers or studies also indicate so so can we can we do something like physical modeling or energy balance of these small cryconite holes to precisely yeah, assert yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 definitely we have to going to that way yeah we can we have to calculate we are, we are also trying to making some model of cryogonite hole and uh, hole is not only the hole itself, we have to model and the entire uh, the surface, abrasion surface, yeah. But well, it, it, it's a good, good certain way to have uh, cryogonite studies. Thank you. Thank you. Ian Evans, you want to unmute yourself? Um. Uh, right, okay. Um, I, I, I'm very interested in, in just how extensive the cryoconite is. Um, it, it's obviously very common in the ablation area, but mm -hmm. um, how high does it go? Does it go right up into the accumulation area and, and how far into it? Actually, no. In the accumulation area, it's a, well, there is again, it's a dust and uh, other kind of microbes actually. It's mostly algae, snow algae is mm -hmm. growing on the snow surface in the accumulation area. Right. And uh, cyanobacteria prefer the condition of the abrasion ice. So they are growing only in the ice surface. So that's why we find it only on the abrasion ice surface. Oh, so great. The, thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks. So we need, of course, understand the system of the material cycle, like, you know, some algae upstream of glaciers and they are flowing, then cryogonites is forming on the abrasion surface. Yeah, this, that's kind of into a system of glacier. Yeah. Great. Uh, Paloma, um, sorry, it's just disappeared off the top of my chat. Somebody else has typed a question, but Paloma, uh, supporter, would you like to ask your question? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Right, thanks for, for the great talk. I have a, a question because you mentioned the, uh, those insects that uh, have been found uh, on the Himalayan glaciers. I was mm -hmm. wondering if there are also some insects in the Arctic or Antarctica where the, if I understood right, cryogonites is in the holes so much deeper and even maybe buried with ice. So are there insects that feed on this cryogonites? in those areas as well? Yeah, okay. And as far as I know, there is uh, no insect in polar glacier in Arctic or Antarctica, but there are some tardigrade, it's water bear or rotifer, much more smaller organisms living in the cryogonites. Lots of, there are lots of publication. But in terms of insects, it's Himalaya, it's very special. We couldn't find the insect in, for example, other Tibetan glaciers, northern part of the glaciers in, on the Tibetan plateau. We couldn't find it. Only the Himalayan region, we found this, this insect. 
And uh, there is some reports, other in insects, it's a stone flies in the living in the New Zealand glaciers. And also it's a, it's a famous, another thing is, uh, it's common name is the glacier dragon in Patagonian glacier. It, it's a, there is a lot of stone fly is also a couple of centimeter size of insects living in the Patagonian glaciers. It, it's also common. That's only I know of a world. And uh, I'd say another more smaller insect in the uh, and Corembra, it's a snow, common name is snow free. That's more commonly observed, in, even in Arctic probably. But it's not only cryogenite hole, but just generally it's seasonal snow patches. And of course on the glacier probably. It's Corembra is a kind of very popular insect anywhere in the world, even in Arctic, Arctic and even in Japan here, we found it on the snow surface. Yeah, that's an insect. Okay, it's a snowfly, Corembra, stonefly, and Mitch. The three is uh, only the insects found on the glaciers, actually. Thank you very much. So thank you. Andre, do you want to unmute yourself? Um, oh, can you hear me? I have a, yes, yes. my link is, okay. Not so more. Thank you very much. Great talk. Uh, you, you already answered partly on my first question, but anyway, do you find something similar to cryoconite with cyanobacteria on other ice surfaces? I don't know, maybe on some perennial snow patches or something like that. That's my first question. And okay. the second is, uh, in some cases, the cryoconite concentrates some chemical elements and radionucleates, in some cases, mm -hmm. rather high level comparing mm -hmm. to surroundings. Mm -hmm. Is that a result of bioactivity or yeah. something else? Uh, please. Okay. Okay. Well, actually, I'm not really find other environments, snow or ice environments, sign of bacteria. Only on the glaciers, actually. Well, not really sure, but yeah, but but there is a some publication from Antarctica. There are some, it's similar thing, cyanobacteria aggregation is growing on the uh, lake ice, the surface of lake ice. Yeah, that's only I know the case. And second question is, yeah, I know it's really hot topic last, last few years and I'm not really exactly see, but well, well, but yeah, maybe some of we yeah, are, there is a report, some microbes aggregates, yeah, concentrate certain chemical substance. It's possibly, yes, but it's need, need to more examine it. I couldn't answer yet. Yeah, but it's interesting topic. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much. Yeah. And in addition, do you try okay. to, um, uh, to, to, to produce something like artificial croconite in, in the lab that on the, uh, you know. Artificially, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah some, some, some people, yes, try to artificially growing on the cryoconite. But actually it's, it's yes, yeah, sometimes they are growing in the laboratory, but I'm not sure that's really exactly the same as we see on the glaciers because, you know, just the uh, simulation is uh, actually it's uh, very difficult because it's low temperature and the uh, surface of glacier condition is a lot of condition with light, ice, flowing water and chemicals. You have to cover everything, but it's so difficult. So, and the microbes, the microbes community is very sensitive to the environment. So if something different, other microbes is more dominant. So change the kind of the species compositions. So it's, it's still uh, not really recovered in the laboratory. So I think better thing is uh, like I show we, have to, yeah, easiest way is just doing on the glacier. Do some experiments. It's, yeah, if you live in more glaciers, yeah. Thank you again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. 
I think we've come to the end of the questions unless anyone has a last one. So um, it's just time to say thank you very much again to Nazuma for such a wonderful seminar today. And to say that next week we have our, our two Seligman Crystal winners giving um, talks um, on, well, Richard Heimarsh and Doug McHale. So uh, please come along to that um, and uh, show our appreciation for their for their work um, uh, that has led to them being awarded the Seligman Crystal. So I'm very much looking forward to that. But today was absolutely fantastic. As uh, Roger Clark says, um, anyone who puts uh, Star Wars in their talk wins uh, hands down. So thank you so much for a really fascinating talk. Really, really enjoyed it. And see everyone next week. Thank you very much. And thank you for getting up so early as well. Yep. Bye to everyone.